This is Self Work, and I'm Dr. Margaret Rutherford. At Self Work, we discuss psychological and emotional issues and what you can do about them, whether that's self acceptance, taking action, or changing your attitude. Eight years ago, I extended the walls of my practice to reach those of you who might already be knowledgeable about mental health treatment, but also to those of you who might say, you'd never darken the door of a therapist, and yet you're here. I'll answer your questions while I invite you to take a few minutes for your own self-work. So can I tell you a fun thing about laughter? I actually interviewed on my podcast the founder of Laughter Yoga. And he lives in India. Yeah. And we started the call. He goes, we're just going to start this call and we're just going to laugh. And so it was literally us just like, <laughs> like, just like, <laughs> <sitting there>, like <laughs> and then it really turned into a real laugh because you're like, this is so silly. I'm not sure I've ever laughed more than in this interview with Erin Deal. She's a top 1% podcast host, founder, and CEO of Improve It, and one of the most electric keynote speakers in the world, using her work as an improvisational actor to teach you and me how our bodies are trying to give us messages about the healing that needs to happen. She's talked with companies like Amazon, LinkedIn, the Obama Foundation, She has an energy and message to share with the world that creates lasting ripple effects for change. And she'll bring at least three to four laugh out loud moments to your day, even though as she calls herself a (laughs) fail-fluencer and urges us to make failure a habit and to heal yourself through humor. As a graduate from Clemson University, and she's a former experiential marketing and recruiting professional, she's also a veteran improviser from the top improvisational training programs in Chicago, including the Second City. She's just a fascinating guest, and I know you'll enjoy this interview with Erin. But before we get there, let's hear from AG1. Our next partner is AG1 the daily foundational nutrition supplement that supports whole body health. I drink it literally every day. I gave AG1 a try because I wanted a single solution that supports my entire body and covers my nutritional bases every day. I wanted better gut health, a boost in energy, immune system support. I take it in the morning before starting my day and I make sure and leave it out for my husband because he tends to forget. I love knowing that I'm starting my day so incredibly well And I wouldn't change a thing because it's really helped me the last two or three years I've taken it. And here's a fact. Since 2010, they've improved their formula 52 times in the pursuit of making this nutrition supplement possible and the best it can be. So if you want to take ownership of your health, it starts with AG1. Try AG1 and get a free one-year supply of vitamin D and five free AG1 travel packs with your first purchase. Go to drinkag1.com slash selfwork. And that's a new link, drinkag1.com slash self-work. Check it out. And now, Aaron Deal. We have Erin Deal, and she's just a joy, and as I said in the intro, she was kind enough to come back on and let me re-record her, or actually record her for the first time. <laughs> so, we, we're calling it a, uh, a dress rehearsal for today, but you are, I, I was so charmed and just so curious and interested in what you said last time, and I can't wait for self-work listeners to actually hear it this time. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I'm excited too, and again... We have to give grace. That is, that's what makes the world go round. And so, Erin, so, tell us about you. Tell us about how you began um, thinking about what you wanted to give back to the world from your personal experience and how those two, your personal and your professional, interacted. And I, I just, I think your story is is so, so uh, just intriguing. Well, so, it, I, I, I'm trying to think of where to start, but I know that I am called here for a purpose. I Mm -hmm. know that I have uh, an actual gift to give the world. And I know I'm here to teach and to help people heal themselves, not only personally, but heal their professional selves too. Mm -hmm. So 
I started at a young age just loving to make people laugh. I was You're always, the class clown? Yes, I was the class clown in high school, okay? And I thought to myself, well, how do I... How do I harness that? And I knew that I wanted to make people laugh. I'm sitting in my podcast closet right now, and I look up here. And hold on, my dog. My dog's entering the scene here. Hello, dog. dog. dog a big deal. Big deal is entering the scene. That's you know, <laughs> toy poodle. But I'm looking at the vision board that I have in my office, and I see Oprah Winfrey, and she was always a guiding light for me too. She was oh, always really? somebody that I just loved and knew that when people were in her presence, they felt better about themselves. Mm -hmm. They, mm -hmm. they wanted to, she just helped people feel like they were reaching their highest, most beautiful self. And that to me was something I wanted. And so I thought, how do I harness this? How do I harness my purpose? Mm -hmm. And how do I make this a way that I can do it every single day of my life and make it into a career? And so you're thought, very unique. You're very unique purpose. Yes. And I think that that's what is so striking about what you offer to groups and companies and individuals is how you pair humor and improvisation into what you teach. Thank you. And that's, it took me a long time to get to that path. I was basically 28 years old when I came up with the idea 30 when I actually executed against it. And I've been living the past decade of my life want, with that mission top of mind to help people be the highest versions of themselves through the use of humor. Mm -hmm. I didn't know in the very beginning how to get there. Mm -hmm. I thought maybe I'd be a florist because they always make people smile. And when you get flowers, you're always happy. But turns out I'm not great with plants. I killed my first plant, Zoe de Planto. Uh, <laughs> and, and, and then I was like, okay, I don't know if I can have an animal. This dog's sitting on my lap. He's an eight-pound toy poodle named Big. Yeah, uh, big deal. deal. Mm -hmm. Yes, big deal. I, I thought, okay, I'm not great with plants. Let me try animals. Luckily, he worked out, and now I have a four-year-old son that also I parent. Um, but I, it's this lens of helping people through human human nature, which is laughter. Mm -hmm. It's mm -hmm. through the lens of love and positivity, which I think a lot of leaders cringe at the word love in the workplace, right? Mm -hmm. And and I think that for today's world the only way to gain a company culture to attract and retain a company that loves the work that they do is by showing them love first mm -hmm. so we use humor to help teach that and we teach on very specific power skills um, but it was through a lot of my own healing and transformation that i even arrived at this was my purpose and I can get into that too, but it's, it's been a journey and an evolution and I'm still evolving and still creating. And I, I think the day that I stop is the day that I won't be here because that's what life to me is all about is evolving and creating and using my highest purpose to give back, which I know is through the use of laughter. So what do you mean by that? How you began to use your own personal experience to say this is where, because I think so many people struggle to find that idea, that direction that uh, that will give them purpose. And it's, it's really, I mean, you know, of course, the there are theorists that say you're all of your 20s are about that. It's about finding your identity. And but I'm, I think probably it goes into your 30s at this point. Uh, because we are delaying a lot of that with the way we are rearing children. And so what what did you discover that would give your, yourself this sense of direction? Yeah. So it actually happened after I had, had started creating Improve It. Okay. I had what I would like to call a homecoming back to myself. Mm -hmm. I started my career as an entrepreneur in the hustle mentality and right. the grind mentality, which, right. you know, there's a lot, I, I believe, in abundance and scarcity and the law of attraction. And when you work mm -hmm. from this place of scarcity, which was sort of my mindset and ego was leading the charge in the beginning of my leadership journey, I wasn't the leader that I knew I could be. And I was limiting, I had a lot of limiting beliefs circulating. I wasn't, um, leading from the place of love. And so over time, I blocked things from coming my way. A child, I wanted to have a child. And as a leader, didn't know if I was able to do that and went through an incredible 
long journey with infertility, mm-hmm. many rounds of, that. Mm-hmm. Yeah, of IVF. And then finally, I had my miracle baby in 2019. Congratulations. And, thank you. And I know you have a miracle baby as well, I a son. Do. He's we 29. Have, <laughs> yes. Our, and mine's four, but they're, you know, I. it's been such a journey of watching his growth. And he is my greatest teacher. But that was something that, as a leader, I had to really overcome is how do I go from this rush, 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 upset me to right. a different version of me and upward me and evolu- uh, evolutionized me. So I started a mindful practice through that journey of meditation. But as that journey continued, I went from having this miracle baby into the global pandemic where my business turned upside down because sure we were did. completely in person, had to become completely virtual. Let's make it, sure we understand. Tell us exactly what the direction of your Improve It business is. You, you, you go to businesses and put on workshops and that kind of thing, right? Exactly. We do workshops, keynotes, and entertainment, mm-hmm. all of mm-hmm. which was in person. Of course. So, of course. yes. So, 2020... Yeah, devastating. And we had just completed this 85 page growth plan for our business for the next five years, which was developing our company in different markets in person. And so that had to be completely shredded. The same time in 2020, I, uh, my mother had a stroke and was in the ICU and was you know, this was during COVID, so I couldn't be there for her. We were oh getting gosh. FaceTimes from nurses, all of those things. And at the same time, while I'm trying to keep this business alive, this six-month-old baby alive, and be there for my family, I am also moving across the country. We decided to move to be closer to my parents. Mm-hmm. And all of this manifested into physical, chronic pain Mm -hmm. and it was rooted in my back and my shoulders. I went to every practitioner possible, chiropractors, general practitioners, acupuncturists. I did cupping. I did Reiki. I did everything that I thought I was supposed to do to heal this pain, and it was undiagnosable. Mm -hmm. So what I really had to do was internalize and look within instead of look outwardly to what was going on. And I read a book by Gabor Mate called When the Body Says No. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And I realized that I was repressing all types of emotions from myself. I was angry for the infertility I had to go through. I was angry at the universe for changing my business and almost taking the life of my mother. Mm -hmm. I was sad and I hadn't mourned the fact that because as I was going through infertility, I just would react and go to the next thing and go to the next thing. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I would disassociate. I was a workaholic. I would pour myself into work or I would pour myself a dirty martini at the end Mm -hmm. of the day. Mm -hmm. And I would just numb my feelings. And that caught up with me about three years ago. And I you've got dirtier and dirtier. Yes, <laughs> that that martini was murky. OK, yeah. <laughs> and um, it was just a really hard time for myself as a leader. But it took a lot of therapy, a lot of journaling, a lot of meditating to realize that the issue was the repressed emotions that I was hiding from. And so when I dug into them on a deep, deep level, Mm -hmm. My pain disappeared. It was not overnight. It took lots of time. Sure. Um, But I no longer have the pain. I have healed from those emotions. I've talked through them. I've talked to the people who I felt like I needed to talk to through those periods and and mend those relationships. And it really... That's transforming. I mean, that's just transforming. Mm -hmm. Yes. And it was this homecoming to myself that allows me to sit here today and talk to you. I just wrote a book. Like I know that that healing was the catalyst for that creativity to be born. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I am just feeling. So so you have some appreciation of it in that a lot of your drive to, to create and help people function better and laugh and all that stuff. A lot of that 
was also part of your protective, you know, I, I've written a book called Perfectly Hidden Depression. And, yes. you know, I talk a lot about how people develop these very protective personas. And some of it is about, you know, laughing things off or, or, um, you know, you just don't, you just don't, you, you, it's not a pretend. You just don't want to allow those painful emotions any airtime and you don't know how and you don't know that it's important. And so they manifest in all kinds of different ways. And I think physical pain is obviously one that is extremely important. Yeah. And it's, you know, this idea of why are we so sick? Like yep. dis ease is disease. The dis ease is from covering these emotions and, and, like you said, allowing them to be just sort of sifted through, through laughter. I did that for my entire life. I was literally the person who, if there was a hard thing going on, I would be the jokester in the room laughing it off because I didn't want to feel. And I think, yeah, I now feel, I feel on a deep level, extremely empathetically. And it's through that lens that I know the company that I run, the people that I serve, the people I lead are able to show up as their highest selves because I am allowing myself to do that. And I'm showing them that it's okay to be human and mm-hmm. have issues. And that's your mantra, which I, is I love on very, a lot of different levels is get comfortable with the uncomfortable. Mm-hmm. And sometimes it is, it is pain or it is embarrassment or it is anxiety or it is a whole range of things that make you uncomfortable. And yet that's where you want to go. That's where you need to, to, you need to lean into that. So let's, let's talk about improvisation a little bit. Yeah. Tell me about the magic of improvisation and how an individual sitting here going, well, wait a minute, I don't run a company or I don't, you know, maybe this might be something I could I could hire her for my company. But how does this apply to me as an individual? Yeah. So, okay, that mantra, get comfortable with the uncomfortable, is an improviser's mantra. Mm-hmm. And I grew up singing, acting, and dancing, all of which had a script. Mm-hmm. The moment I entered an improv class, I had the sweatiest armpits. It was exposure (laughs) therapy for me because there was no script. It requires you to let go. It requires you to be present in the moment. It requires you to bring everyone into the scene of your life. It is, I truly firmly believe that if every single person invested in improv, as an art form, as a hobby, as a teaching tool for themselves, the world would be a better place because the characteristics of a great improviser make up the characteristics of a great human. You become a better listener. You become more present. You're able to think more quickly on your feet. You're able to postpone judgment and allow all ideas to be heard. You are in the scene with the people around you. It's not you, the star. It's you, the people collectively. So it's such a collaboration tool and it's just truly is a life changing teaching tool so tell them what improvisation is as best you can yes okay well if somebody walked into an improv class yeah and they did their first improv exercise what would that sound like what would that look like well i do know the definition of improv from Wikipedia. <laughs> okay. And I think I, I, I'll share it. It's the practice of acting, singing, talking, and reacting of making and creating in the moment in the response to the stimulus of one's immediate environment and inner feelings. That's the actual definition. But the real <laughs> definition is it's what we call yes and. It is listening to an idea, postponing judgment, dropping your idea, and adding to it. So okay. if, if you were to say, you know, the sky is falling. And I would say, yes, and and it's going to be a great day. Let's have a party because the sky is falling. I would add to it. I wouldn't negate you. So, No, it's not. I can see the sky and it's not falling. Yeah, right. Mm -hmm. Right. And then you can't you can't go anywhere from that. So improv, if you walk into a class, is a room filled with people interacting with with each other in a way that allows people to feel seen heard and valued. It is a positive space. 
You have to have a safe space in order to do improv. You can't get on stage with seven people and hear one suggestion from the audience and create a 30 minute set without having the people on stage's backs. And I've been with teams that don't have each other's back in my improv career and they just don't work. I sure. actually part of a team called going nowhere and we that's exactly where we went <laughs> because we did not yes sand each other so it's it is all about oh you're good i i just think it's very hard to describe because it is an experiential thing because when you are in and i know you've done it which i love yeah it I is am. it's like this just gel of energy it's it's responding to each other's energy but with the best form of energy. It's mm -hmm. responding with positive love, acceptance, and pure collaboration. And so on an individual level, that's how it reaches humans. On a team level, it, co it takes a divided team and it allows them to collaborate in a way that they never would before and see each other differently. It humanizes the work experience. I can just go on and on. So stop me and I'll well, stop. So, so what I want to try to break down for people is, is as I'm listening and I think about how I use improvisation myself as a therapist, I think that when, you know, when someone is talking, I can either be sitting there thinking, what am I going to respond or I can be really listening and, and like you say, yes, and I can say, and how long have you felt this way? Or, and, and what do you do when you feel that way? Or, and, um, or show me, uh, well, it just, it's, it's, I mean, it's not, I mean, you know, we're not entertaining anyone. So it's, but it's that kind of putting your own decision, make your own, need for a conversation to go a certain way and letting the other person lead it and then you follow and then they follow you and you follow them and it's it's a it's an exchange and it it's fun to do it's it's and in fact i have prescribed it quote unquote for especially my really anxiety ridden patients that yes. it's you know it's a it's a wonderful environment. We have a, a university here in my um, in my region, and they give improv classes, and whereas some of the theater uh, groups do too. And so, I think it's a great experience. It really is, and it's exactly what you said. It is the purest form of give and take, and mm -hmm. it is the purest form of presence. And I want to just touch on that really quick because we always say that it really does make you a good listener. But if you were a person in normal conversation listening. Mm -hmm. If my hand and my very tip of my finger, and mm -hmm. I know some people are just listening, so you can't see me, but I'm, I'm pointing to the tip of my finger and I'm extending it to my elbow. If this, at the tip of my finger to my elbow was a sentence, at what point in the sentence do you think that most people stop listening? Oh, about uh, your second knuckle. Yeah. Yes. And I've heard cuticle before. So knuckle mm -hmm. feels better. Okay. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. truly like people stop listening here. And when we stop listening, let's say at the knuckle, we miss the meat and potatoes. We barely get the appetizer of the meal of the sentence. And so when that happens, people know when they aren't being listened to. And that's, sure. it, it just causes a ripple effect in conversations, a ripple effect in cultures. So we really teach people to listen to the end especially in an improv for work scenario listen to the end of a sentence and challenge them to use their last word of the sentence that somebody just said to start their sentence so for example if you oh, were just fascinating fascinating it is and so we would use your word to start our sentence and that way we can't plan what mm -hmm. we are saying we are yeah, right. in that conversation all planning goes out the window and when you allow the planning to go out the window this is where the comedy comes in you're reacting just in the moment and the, that that little reaction that little spark of truth that just happened right there that spark is where the comedy lies it's the truth mm -hmm. in the comedy and mm -hmm. as a class clown I was a horrible improviser at first. I would walk into a room, an improv class or a rehearsal, and I would try to be the funniest person. Sure. I'd try to have the one-liner. Yeah. That doesn't work. Mm -mm. It does not work. Not a solo act. Yeah. You look like 
the the jerk. Yes, and like the asshole. You, <laughs> yes, an asshole. Okay, I was hoping I could curse on the show. So yeah, you look like the asshole. And that is what the audience feels. That's what your scene partners feel. And that's why I say the qualities of a great improviser make up the qualities of a great human because a great improviser allows everybody to feel seen, heard, and valued, allows everybody to have a say in the scene or have their voice be heard, is collaborative, is listening effectively, and is reacting in that moment. And it is, it's an art form. And it's one of those life skills that once you learn it, you just, it just applies to everything in your life. Yeah. I, I, how many times have I said to couples, you know, it looks like you stopped listening and they go, well, I know what she's going to say. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah exactly. Or I've heard it a hundred times before. And, you know, I, I will say something like, you know, how many hours do you spend away from each other a day? And they'll say, oh, 10, you know, an eight or 10. So you think nothing has changed that person in those eight or 10 hours that perhaps would be interesting to listen to yeah. and to try to pick up on? It's, it's like we, we, we lose our curiosity and, and, and then we get in ruts and that kind of thing. And so I think this is a wonderful tool. You also have some things that, you know, you say, for example, you want to make failure a habit. What do you mean by that? Yeah. So one of the biggest rules of improv is there are no mistakes, only gifts. Mm -hmm. So if you and I were in a scene together on the improv stage and, you know, let's just say I spilled something on the stage. I like knocked something over and I, I knocked over a chair and I go, oh, crap. And Obviously, the audience knows what I just did. They saw me make the mistake, but I just skim over it like nothing happened. They're thinking in themselves, she just knocked over that chair. She's not going to acknowledge that. But if I allow it to be a part of the scene and yeah. I say, oh, craps, <laughs> oh, I knocked over this chair. But you know what? Craps is my favorite game to play in Vegas. Okay, Dr. Margaret, do you want to start planning that girl's trip to Vegas right now? I and love then, Vegas. I love Vegas. I love that Midler. I, I got to yes. see her, except there was a big column in my way. Oh, no. Okay. Well, how about we go? And I wonder if Celine is still playing and we get tickets to that show and I'll make sure you're column free. Oh, column free is good. I am there and Celine. <laughs> oh, my God. <laughs> yeah. See, And so that's allowing it to go somewhere. So if you take that metaphor and you apply that to life. So, you know, I'm what I call a fail fluencer. Okay. I'm not an influencer. I'm a fail fluencer. I think about, I, influ I influence people to fail forward in their life mm -hmm. because you can allow those things that are mistakes to stay mistakes and you can beat yourself up about them, or you can allow them to become a part of the scene of your life and take the lesson and leave the mistake in the past. Couldn't say it any better. Thank you. I, I And so I love talking about failure and I love allowing it to become a part of the scene because I think teachers teach what they need to know. And I think that is deeply one of my greatest lessons to learn here on earth is resiliency. And so I am teaching that and speaking that and preaching that because I also need to learn it. And I have through teaching. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And it's accepting that the resilience is not not having any difficulties. The resilience is handling the failures, handling the successes. You know, uh, one of my working definitions of self acceptance, and I say working because I, I don't know, is it is it what I you know is what what I will always feel? But yeah, you know, knowing that your strengths nor your vulnerabilities completely define you. Neither one of them, yeah. and they are all part of you. And so I I love this, you know, just accept failure and accept mistakes and it, you know you know you can feel remorse for them for a while okay but move on and learn from it as you say and you, you know you talk a lot about healing yourself through humor we had a two years ago my, i was talking about this yesterday and my husband and i kept saying last year last year he goes Margaret, that was two years ago i went oh, okay. <laughs> so anyway um two years ago my best friends from high school we met together and we were um in that pit, that part of the visit where we were getting a little more introspective with one another and we went around and said what do you think your your one of your strengths is what what are you what do you like about yourself and 
all of them looked at me and they were going, you're going to say laughter, aren't you? You're going to say. <laughs> yeah. And I say, yes, because I love to laugh and I laugh all the time with my patients. In fact, during the, during the pandemic and even now when I'm working virtually, my husband will just hear me downstairs, just the, my tone of my voice that I'm laughing. He goes, you laugh a lot in therapy. And I said, yes, I do, because it's so important not to, or, or to have that sense of flexibility and, and, um, kindness toward yourself, which sometimes makes you laugh. Compassion toward yourself, which makes you laugh. Um, just seeing yourself as the human being you are and the, you know, having your, your ups and your downs and, you know, just making stupid mistakes. Yes. Yes. <laughs> and laughter is contagious. Like it's the best form of therapy it's also an ab workout like you know you can yeah. do a workout a mental physical workout so can i tell you a fun thing about yeah. laughter i actually interviewed on my podcast the founder of laughter yoga and he lives in india okay so we had to like get the time zones coordinated yeah. and we started the call he goes we're just gonna start this call and we're just gonna laugh and so it was literally us just like <laughs> like just like <laughs> sitting there like <laughs> and then it really turned into a real laugh because you're like this is so silly and the whole conversation was so laughter filled and he uses laughter as a way to do yoga for the brain and help heal people and oh, it's just this beautiful tool that we're given that sometimes we don't use enough and i think that it's wonderful that that's what you said about yourself because it's <laughs> a blessing so to have i don't know what they call it now we called it an annual it was like what came out your senior year of high school and in mine it says margaret spends most of the time with one foot on the ground and the other in her mouth <laughs> 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 yes yes okay let me tell you i that could have gone next to my picture in my yearbook too okay listen <laughs> and that's fail fluid saying no mistakes only gifts you know i've learned over time erin shut your trap but you know i think it's like it's it's so important to embrace it because if we don't we're just wasting a natural gift that we've been given sure so if you're if you are a part of a company or uh, a business or whatever that you think you could use Aaron services on improve it. They're, they go all over the world for seminars and that would be great. But I, we, I really wanted to focus on how individuals could use this. And I think we've done, hopefully maybe we failed at that. I don't know. <laughs> yeah, maybe. And you know what? I'm going to say fail. Yeah. For that. Fail, if we yeah. Fail, if we fail. Fail. Well, I do have one thing that I could give somebody to use on an individual basis. Right. Uh, a great activity that you can use anytime you are feeling down and you yeah. are feeling, if you are feeling anxiety that is pulled from the improv stage and it's called new choice. So uh, can I, can I use you? Dr. Sure. Martin, yeah. my, guinea pig my, here? my heart rate just went up. <laughs> okay. No, you're going to do great. You're going to do great. So here's how it works just in general from an improv perspective. So um, let's just pretend I'm in the middle of a conversation right now with you. We're just going to keep this conversation. Let's pretend we're doing it. Yes. So you would say new choice and right. I would have to okay. change the last thing that I said to something different. So I'll tell you about my weekend plans. Okay. Mm -hmm. So um, this weekend I am going to this aquarium here in Charleston and they are turning off all the lights and all of the fish tanks new and choice. it's going to have uh, they're turning on all the lights. It's going to be this like gigantic, well lit party. Everybody even has flashlights because that's how much light they want in this aquarium. Uh, they don't want anybody to have light in the aquarium. They actually have changed it now to coming um, with blindfolds on. So everybody's showing up with the blindfold. <laughs> and you're going to have to just walk around the space. You're going to have to run around the space in a blindfold. Okay, <laughs> so you get where I'm going with that. So that's how you play it in an improv perspective. But how you can apply it to your life is if you are thinking a negative thought, if you are in a spiral of anxiety and you need to just whip yourself out of it, you just hit a clap and say new choice. So let's say I'm spiraling. I got to give a talk tomorrow night. Okay. And so I'm spiraling about I'm going to this talk and I don't know a single person in that room. 
new choice. I'm going to walk in that room and make one new friend right away. And that person's going to be my buddy. And they're going to cheer for me when I get on that stage. So you're taking that negative thought. You're replacing it with a positive thought. One thing I forgot to mention, when you clap and you tell yourself new choice, automatically forgive yourself for that negative thought. That's really important to remind yourself, like, it's okay. I'm human. I'm going to have negative thoughts. Po the most positive Pamela in the world still has negative thoughts about sure. themselves. Sure. So forgive yourself and then redirect it. But that clap new choice just snaps you out of that spiral. The forgiveness allows you to see yourself as human and the redirection it just gives you a new perspective. Words really matter because the words we say are, are from the thoughts that we think. So our thoughts affect our words. Our words affect our actions. And so the more kind things that we can think, the more th kind things we can speak, the more kind we can leave the world and leave our imprint on it. So I just think it's a really cool thing. If we That hopefully got the individual sure, something exactly. to lead with so we didn't fail on that one. Yeah, hopefully. and the cognitive behavioral people would love that too because they, of course, think, you know, your thoughts lead to your emotions. And and yeah, my my clap is not a physical clap, but I'll say to people, just say, stop it, stop it. Yeah. And then go on stop to, it. you know, every person that I know now was someone I didn't know. Yes, <laughs> you know, every yes. Person. I didn't know them, you know, before I met them. So anyway, you're right. And I, I think that's great. And it's not it's false talk. You're not trying to like convince yourself to not have those negative feelings, but to balance them out and to not let them just send you down this negative, you know, spiral, as they call it. Well, great suggestion. So how can my audience find you, Erin Deal? Oh, you're so sweet. Well, you can check out my podcast, the Improve It Podcast, which Dr. Margaret is going to come on in the new year. I'm very excited. Hey, and uh, you could just check me out on itserindeal.com or at itserindeal on Instagram. I like Deal is D-I-E-H-L. Right? That's right. And okay. this is my dog, Big Big Deal. deal. How big? Your child is not named Big, is it? No, it's Jackson. But I, <laughs> I thought about naming him Dunn. Do you and <laughs> Or if it was a girl, Silda. <laughs> Seal the deal. <laughs> I got it. <laughs> I had to repeat that one out loud. I was like, did I did I say that? So it is yeah, it's a fun last name. It's a p I married into this name and I was very grateful because I love a good pun. So You know, I almost didn't marry my now husband who's my number three because my number one was also named Rutherford. <laughs> <No>! <laughs> I finally said, well, I can get out the old towel. They'll still work. That is hilarious. I'm a good Southern girl and I've got, That's all, right. you know, my, my, you got the monograms. Monogram towels. Sure. That's right. <laughs> that is right. I know about a monogram towel. Okay. I sure do. You are so awesome. Thank you so much for this conversation. And I'm Thank so you. excited to have you on our show too. I'm excited too. I'm going to love you. We'll, we'll celebrate the new year. That's right. That is right. Thanks so much for being here today. I thoroughly enjoyed bringing you Erin. I think she's just hilarious and brings a little lighthearted humor to this holiday season that we need that humor pretty badly. As always, you can subscribe at drmargaretrutherford.com and you will receive a weekly newsletter with my podcast and a blog post and anything else I've got going on. Would love to see you there. And of course, join my Facebook group at facebook.com slash groups slash self work. Again, my gratitude toward you for being here. Please take care of yourself, your family, and your community. I'm Dr. Margaret, and this has been Self Work.